Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, uh, Hamilton's Generous Financial Aid Promise. My name is Ben Rose. I'm an Associate Dean of Admission at Hamilton and also a graduate class of 09. Um, thank you for joining us for our session this evening. Uh, joining me here is my colleague, uh, Jan Sutso, Hamilton's Executive Director of Financial Aid, uh, who has also served in different roles supporting students and families throughout the college process, uh, both as a former college counselor and as an admission officer. Uh, during tonight's conversation, Executive Director Sutso will demystify the process of applying for financial aid, talk Talk about our generous resources and provide some guidelines and financing options for you and your family to think about as you consider this important investment. Uh, in a moment, I will have Executive Director Schutzo provide some additional background into her role here on the Hill. Uh, but before that, I do also want to introduce two other colleagues who are here with me tonight. Um, JD Ross, Associate Dean of Admission, is going to be answering any kind of admission focused questions that come up uh, in the chat. Uh, and Marianne Atkinson, uh, our direct Associate Director of Financial Aid, is also here to help with financial aid related questions. Um, please use the question and answer function in tonight's webinar to submit questions if you if you can. Uh, and we will start with a, a, a little presentation uh, by Executive Director Schutzel. Um, so take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Again, thank you, Ben, for the warm welcome and introduction. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy evenings to join us tonight as we share some important information about my favorite topic, student financial aid, but more importantly, to share some important information about Hamilton's very generous financial aid promise and commitment to meet 100% of our students' demonstrated financial need throughout their entire enrollment at Hamilton College. So tonight I will explain how our, we calculate a student's financial need. I will review a sample financial aid award letter and student eligibility for financial aid. And I'll highlight some important distinctions between our institution's need-based policies. So tonight's agenda, We'll include, I'll begin with sharing the financial aid language. Our financial aid world is so engrossed with acronyms and terms that may be foreign to you at this point in time in your process, but hopefully at the end of the evening, you have some comfort level and knowledge regarding them. And then I'll review our financial aid eligibility criteria and a sample financial aid award letter for you. And I'll offer some insight on two financial aid applications called the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and the CSS Profile. And most importantly, I'll have plenty of time to answer your questions regarding the overall financial aid process. So let's get going. The key, one of the key financial aid acronyms that we use is called the EFC, and this is the expected family contribution. It is important to note that the main foundation of need-based financial aid calculations is builds around the assumption that the primary source of, a, of the student's resources to pay for their educational expenses is the family. And the family includes a student contribution and a parent contribution. Hamilton College uses resources called the FAFSA and CSS profile and the 2020 tax return information to calculate an expected family contribution number. And we'll get into more information regarding filing the FAFSA and the CSS profile in a few slides. The primary drivers to calculate a family's contribution is income and assets from the student and the parent, number of people in the household, and number of people attending college. Another key acronym in our world of financial aid is called the cost of attendance, or COA. Cost of attendance includes direct costs and indirect costs, and the total of these include a student's cost of attendance. So the direct costs that you will actually see on your bill are tuition and fees, room and board, and health insurance if, if it applies to the student's need. Indirect costs or non-billable charges include an allowance for books and supplies, travel, and miscellaneous or personal expenses. Those five components add up to our total cost of attendance. And it's important to highlight that note because we are including all the true expenses for a student to that will a student will have 
while they are attending college for the academic year. So we're projecting total expenses, billable and non-billable for a family's convenience. We use these two acronyms, the cost of attendance and the expected family contribution to, determines a, to determine a student's demonstrated financial need. The main formula includes beginning with the cost of attendance. And I have a, a example of $75,000 cost of attendance. From that, we are going to subtract the family contribution, the expected family contribution that we calculated from the CSS profile, the FAFSA data, and 2021 tax return information for a family, a student beginning fall 23. That yields the student's demonstrated financial needs. So for in this example, our student has a financial need of $65,000. And our financial aid award will include a total of need-based aid, including summing $65,000. That is our commitment of meeting 100% of a student's demonstrated need. Other schools may not be able to have the, the resources to commit to meeting 100% need. For example, if a student's financial aid award letter was only 58,500 in this example, that would be 90% of their financial need and they would be gapped. And that is another term in our financial aid language of gapping. Hamilton College does not um, gap our students. We meet 100% of our students' financial need. So let's share with that example of a $65,000 demonstrated need, what a Hamilton College financial aid statement of eligibility will look like. It's comprised of three main components. Hamilton scholarships, which would be grants and scholarships, which are free money the student does not have to pay back. A federal student work study or work allotment of $2,000. And the federal student loan, of subsidized student loan of $3,500. Now, all these categories of aid are need-based aid and add up to the $65,000, and thus we are meeting 100% of the student's financial need. Let's talk a little bit about the federal work-study opportunity. This is an opportunity for your child to secure a job on campus, earn a paycheck, and they're paid every two weeks, um, and they can use that money directly deposited into their bank account to use for future educational expenses, miscellaneous expenses, it's their choice. That money is not expected to be redirected to pay their bill. That is their money to earn and keep and, and save for additional future educational expenses. The subsidized loan is a need-based loan in the student's name only. And it is subsidized in the sense that the government will pay the interest for the student while they are enrolled all four years and during their six month grace period. Interest only begins to accrue when the student begins repayment, usually six months after graduation. No payments are required during their enrollment on this subsidized student loan. So it's a good loan to secure and it, it comprises of some uh, what we call is student um, self-help aid between the work study and the student loan. So to talk a little bit more about the federal student loans that we provide in our financial aid packages, here is a federal student loan chart that shows the um, maximum amount of federal student loans students can receive from the federal government. And their application is the FAFSA. Hamilton's unique need-based financial aid policy is that we only award the subsidized loan amounts, the interest-free loans to our students initially. They can request the additional unsubsidized of $2,000 in academic year, but they just need to contact our office to do so. So with that thinking, we are minimizing our students' debt load and debt, debt burden and highlighting that we are offering interest-free loans initially at the point of awarding. You can see that the loan amount increases as the academic level increases. In sophomore year, we will be awarding $4,500. In their junior year, we will be awarding $5,500 and same amount in the senior year of $5,500. Again, these student loans are in our student's name only. 
mom and dad do not need to co-sign for them. And they do, do need to complete an initial entrance counseling and a promissory note online at the federal website called studentaid.gov to initiate disbursement of these student loans, along, along with a Hamilton student loan authorization forms indicating that they accept and want to borrow our student loans that we are awarding. So let's review some of the language that we have just discussed as far as our COAs and terms that we've just used. The acronyms that we covered were the expected family contribution number and the cost of attendance. EFC is what the family is expected to contribute towards this educational expense and is calculated from data from the FAFSA and the CSS profile, which we will discuss in a little bit more detail in a few slides. The cost of attendance is our overall arching estimate of cost of attendance for this academic year, including billable charges of tuition fees, room and board, and health insurance expenses as applicable, and non-billable expenses of travel, miscellaneous, and books and supplies. Another uh, important terminology that we've covered already includes our demonstrated need. The demonstrated need is calculated from the CSS profile and tax return information, and it is true documented resources that we can see this, the family has to contribute towards the family expected contribution. Demonstrated need is documented need, unlike disclosed need, um, as according to what a family may say, this is what I can contribute, and this is the, the need level of my child. Unfortunately, we don't go with dis disclosed need. We only use demonstrated need according to our resources and applications that we have secured. Again, to reiterate, Hamilton College meets full demonstrated financial need for all four years of enrollment, and we do not gap our students. Another term that we have not um, discussed fully here tonight, but you may have heard, is need blind versus need aware. I'm so fortunate to work at an institution that combines the um, need blind admissions process with meeting 100% of demonstrated need. On admissions processing, we are not considering the ability of a family to pay in the admissions process. So that is what need blind means, unlike need aware, where we are considering financial resources in the admission process. And for more information regarding need blind versus need aware, please refer to our website regarding this topic. Now let's change our, FASA, our focus to some applications that you will file to determine your student's financial need. First is the FAFSA. And that's the hardest part of tonight's presentation is actually saying the word FAFSA, which stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid, another acronym that we use in our world of financial aid. And free is a key word here. There is not a charge to complete the FAFSA, and if you are on a site, the FAFSA website to complete the application is studentaid.gov. You want to be on .gov websites when you're completing these. You want to, it begins um, open effective July, October 1 in 2022 for the fall 23 entry cycle. And there will be two FAFSAs open at this current time in October. You want to make sure that you'll be completing the 23, 24 FAFSA. The FAFSA must be completed every single year, and the FAFSA is asking information regarding the student and the custodial parent's income and assets, assets, number of people in the household, and number of people in college. The FAFSA is a key component in the sense that it only asks for custodial parent information. And the FAFSA def defines custodial parent as a parent in which the child lives with more um, in the academic year than 50% or more. Um, it's not necessarily the parent that the child claims um, on their tax return. It is the custodial parent is defined as the parent that the child lives with most of the time. The website to file the FAFSA is again studentaid.gov and there's also an app to file the FAFSA. So the government is truly trying to make ease of filing the FAFSA very accessible and easy. 
There's a lot of skip logic in the FAFSA. It should probably take about 20 to 30 minutes to complete the FAFSA every single year. And I would highly recommend that you have all your resources available when you begin this process by having your 21 tax returns, 21 W-2s, any current bank statement um, and investment information so you can easily enter the data as you complete the application. You can send the FAFSA to multiple schools at one time and it's free. You can send it up to 10 schools um, to receive your FAFSA data. The FAFSA is needed to consider your eligibility for the following resources, federal resources. The federal Pell Grant, which is a free grant um, for our need-based students. And in addition to our Pell Grant um, eligibility, there is another supplemental educational opportunity grant from the federal government that is in addition to the Pell Grant. Another type of federal aid that the FAFSA is gaining access to is called the federal direct loans. And those are the loan amounts that I showed you, the $3,500 subsidized loan in the sample financial aid package. Another access is the federal work study opportunity that I mentioned in our sample financial aid award letter. These are all federal um, programs that the FAFSA will garner access to. The FAFSA may also be required for any state scholarships for example, our New York State TAP grant requires a FAFSA filing first, and any possible outside scholarships sometimes require the FAFSA. So at Hamilton College, we require the FAFSA and the CSS profile, so you will be completing this application if you're interested in any need-based financial aid. The bottom line calculation from the FAFSA is the federal expected family contribution number which is a combination of a student contribution and a parent contribution. To help you file the FAFSA, the government has rolled out a tool called the IRS Data Retrieval Tool. I highly recommend that our families and students use this um, IRS Data Retrieval Tool when you get to the financial section of the FAFSA because it will correctly extract your completed 21 tax return information and transfer it directly into your FAFSA without having uh, the need for you entering this information. It correctly grabs the, the proper data points that we need and it really minimizes the potential of any errors. And it also reduces your chance of federal verification which is a process where the Department of Ed is going to verify random FAFSA filers data. And if you use the IRS data retrieval tool, they believe the, the information is accurate and exact and chances for verification selection are drastically reduced. The next application that we are going to require for our financial aid recipients is called the CSS profile the College Scholarship Service Profile. This is a document that again, you complete every single year. It opens up around the same time as the FAFSA, October 1, every single year. There is a fee to complete the CSS profile, but waivers are available. The standard fee is $9 to submit the application and $16 for every subsequent school that you send the application to. Um, Again, as you enter data on the CSS profile, there is some skip logic that will indicate if you're eligible for a fee waiver. But at Hamilton College, we, we don't want any barriers to access and applications um, filed. So if you feel the CSS profile charge is um, a barrier, please contact our office and we'll see if we're eligible for a fee waiver. The CSS profile is requested to be completed by our U.S. citizens and our non-U.S. citizens. It must be completed every year. And again, similarly to the FAFSA, there are sections for the students, custodial, and non-custodial parent. As I mentioned earlier, the family contribution is a combined student and family resources number. And the CSS profile is giving us more information regarding the non-custodial household, which is expected to contrib contribute towards the educational expenses of the student. 
The website to file the, the CSS profile is cssprofile.collegeboard.org. So you may ask, how do I know how much financial aid I will be eligible for? We have some tools on our website called Estimate Your Financial Aid. We have two tools. One is called My Intuition and the other is called Net Price Calculator. The My Intuition is a quick five or six question summary, an estimate of a range of financial aid eligibility that you may be were, um, eligible for. If you want more of a complete exact specific to your information, you could use our net price calculator. Every college is expected to have a net price calculator. And in that methodology, we share our, our institutional um, methodology. So it's a little bit more accurate guesstimate than the My Intuition calculator, but both are very helpful tools. And I highly recommend that you use them so you know exactly what your expected family contribution may be as you begin this exciting process of the college admissions process. So that is the end of our presentation on the language of the financial aid, the common terms we use, the sample financial aid award letter and eligibility resources for need-based need financial aid, and the applications that are, our families are expected to complete to be considered for need-based financial aid. And now we're going to open up the conversation to questions from our, our students and families. Ben? All right. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, the, the questions have been pouring in. <laughs> so uh, let's get started with one um, about international student financial aid. Um, mm -hmm. Does Hamilton offer it? And in what ways does it differ from uh, applying for financial aid as yes. a domestic applicant? Thank you very much. Great question. Yes, we do. We do offer, um, we also meet 100% fin financial need for international students, and we ask them to complete the CSS profile. Our Canadian um, international students, we will also ask for their T1 and T4 documentation as far as tax return information, but our other in international students, we just require the CSS profile. Great. Um, related question, if someone, is, a student is a U.S. citizen, but the parents aren't um, and are living abroad, can they still file the FAFSA? If the student is an eligible, um, not eligible citizen for Title IV aid, I would recommend that they complete the FAFSA. Um, the, uh, and it's also important that the entire, that the family complete the CSS profile so we have an accurate assessment of all family resources. Um, we've got a lot of FAFSA questions. So another FAFSA question here. Okay. Um, can you only send the FAFSA to 10 schools? It depends. You can, yes, it depends on what the school is requiring. Hamilton College requires the, the FAFSA and the CSS profile. But if your institution that you may be considering is only requires the FAFSA, then you only need to complete the FAFSA. And yes, you can only send it to 10 schools. If you wanted to send it to the 11th school, you would have to remove one of the previously listed institutions and add that new school. And a note to share about the completed FAFSA, your, your student will know that they've received um, and submitted a successful FAFSA. They will get an email from the Department of Ed called a SAR, a student aid report, which will summarize their eligibility for federal student aid and their anticipated um, family contribution, federal family contribution number. So be on the lookout after you submit your FAFSA in about two to three days to, to receive that email from the Department of Ed. Uh, so continuing to roll through FAFSA questions, okay. um, if you make a mistake on the FAFSA, is there a way to correct that? Absolutely. You don't have to do a new FAFSA. You just go into the existing FAFSA form and there is a choice. And it says, are you a new filer or are you making a correction? And you want to select the make of the correction one. And you can toggle right to the area that you want to make a correction in, whether it's income, um, um, maybe enter your IRS data retrieval tool information or add a school code. That's where you make that correction. Um. Great. We, we had a couple questions about those student loans. Um, do you happen to know the interest rate on the student loans right now? Uh, 
It or changes no. <laughs> every July one, and there are low fixed rate rates of four point two. I I don't want to misquote, so okay. it just changed, and I, and I want to um, happy to share that with the with the team and with our audience when it's um, uh, notated. Okay, and would it be publicly available on on a site? Absolutely, on our website yeah. it is also. Great. Um, and does the interest deferment continue if they start graduate school? It does. As long as the student is enrolled more than um, half time status, which is usually six credits or more, then the payment is deferred, but interest will begin to accrue on any, un will continue to accrue on any unsubsidized loan. Mm -hmm. um, got a clarification question. I know you mentioned this term in your presentation, but could you explain gapping again and what does gapping refer to? Gapping is something that Hamilton College does not do. Gapping is the sense where perhaps an institution may only provide merit money, merit institutional aid, and the, the student's need is not being met by that merit scholarship. Um, so the student is gapped. Their awards may add up to $20,000, but their financial need may be $50,000. So is, there is a $30,000 gap. I am so happy to, to um, work at an institution that is so strong in their commitment for student support and success that we, not only do we um, provide a need blind admissions process, but we couple that with meeting 100% of a student's demonstrated need. So it's, it's just another example of our strong commitment to our students. Uh, question about the CSS profile. Um, how would one go about getting a fee waiver for the CSS profile? Well, as I mentioned, in the application itself, if you have certain income levels, I believe it's under $100,000 adjusted gross income, you are automatically qualified for a um, CSS profile waiver. But if you're not getting that auto automatic criteria or fee waiver information, please just contact our office and we'll be happy to um, evaluate your, your circumstances and provide a waiver if necessary. Um, question about what happens if uh, income decreases during a student's time at Hamilton, You know, say a parent retires, um, uh, do they reapply for financial aid or is there some other thing that, that comes into play in that circumstance? Great question. Keep in mind, we're, we're using prior prior income as you found the CSS profile and the FAFSA. So we're well aware that life changes in a two year period. So that's when you um, contact our financial aid office and we will have a conversation with you and see if a financial aid appeal is um, the right direction to do. And you are able to inform us of current income um, or assets or higher expenses or whatever life may be. Um, throwing at you at this point in time that it's not disclosed on the profile or the or the FAFSA. Um, and we look at all those um, elements of consideration to see if there's any additional resources that the institution can provide. Um, but it is a it is a individual student review that happens is then automatic. In regards to retirement, that is viewed um, depends if we would make an adjustment for retirement. If it's a forced retirement, we uh, the institution views retirement as an option, a choice that the parent is making at a certain point in time. So there is an, an automatic reduction of uh, family contribution based on a retirement. It may eventually be represented in the future FAFSA filings because we're looking at prior, prior year. It'll eventually catch up to the family. Um, question about process here. At what point in the application process should a student uh, start working on the FAFSA and, and the CSS profile Great and question. submit them? You can, you can do some pre-work, some pre-homework for the FAFSA filing. The FAFSA is going to open up October 1, and that is earlier than it used to many, many years ago. It never became open until like January, mid-January. So the point the, the Department of Ed made some positive changes. They opened up the FAFSA application sooner in the cycle, and they used prior prior income so that there is definitely a filed completed tax return that the students are going to use to file this application. They don't have the stress of scurrying to try and file the tax return and use and submit the FAFSA all in the early part of um, the future academic year. So to answer your question, yes, you can 
do some homework and pre-work for the FAFSA in the sense of creating a username and password, one for the student and one for the parent. And they can go on the same website, studentaid.gov, and click on the link to that says create your FSA ID. And it's just basic demographic information about the student and the parent. And then the parent and the student need to list separate and unique email addresses tied to their username and password. As parents, I know we're so eager to kind of control the process and control communication. And we may want to list our email on the student email and the federal government really does not like that. So we want separate and distinct email address to initiate and create a username and password that the, st the student and the parent will use for the next four years, every single year to file their FAFSA. So you can create that username and password for FSA ID as we use acronym in the, in the business um, right now. You don't have to wait till October 1 to do that. And then when you have those completed, and let them process through the background checks of the Department of Ed and, and um, SSA, et cetera. Then I would wait till like maybe October four, five, six to begin to file the FAFSA. You don't wanna be the, the early bird and do it on October one, just in case there's a little hiccup with the TAP application and stuff. So I always recommend families do it early, but wait till maybe the sixth or seventh of, eight of, of October to complete it. And a nice highlight about the TAP application, at the end of the FAFSA, there is a box that says, do you want to complete your new, your state application? It will not reference New York State TAP application, because keep in mind, the FAFSA is a national form, so they're not going to identify every state's little um, state name grant. So you click on the the section that says, do you want to complete your state application? At the same time, before you hit submit, or right at the time of submission, and all your FAFSA data will transfer over into your New York State TAP application and make filing for that much, much easier also. If you lose the opportunity to submit the TAP application at that same time, then you just have to wait about three or four days for your FAFSA to process in the central processing department, and then you can go to the New York State TAP site directly and complete the TAP application for our New York State residents. So to answer that question, yes, file, get your FSA ID early now and file the FAFSA early in about the first week when it becomes available. No, don't wait. <laughs> don't wait, don't wait. Um, question about outside scholarships. So if a student applies for and receives a scholarship from a third party organization, how does that factor into the financial aid at Hamilton? Great question. We encourage outside scholarships wholeheartedly. And how we um, enter them into the financial aid package is first, we eliminate the self-help aid that I mentioned earlier, the student's loan commitment of $3,500 and the student's work commitment of $2,000. So if your outside scholarship is above and beyond those two resources of $5,500, then we will go in and reduce our Hamilton scholarship to accommodate for this new outside funds. Because again, we're meeting 100% of financial need. Um, outside scholarships are not intended to reduce family contribution. Um, question about need. Um, there's an individual who posted a question saying, do we have any aid above EFC? Um, they say EFC is highly inaccurate. My guess they might be talking about FAFSA EFC there. Um, do we take that into account? Well, we take it into consideration as far as the review process. We verify 100% of our financial aid applicants. So we're going to request um, 2021 tax returns, business tax returns, W-2s, et cetera, and really take a personal review of the data to minimize those chances of errors on the FAFSA filing. A um, couple questions here about how we consider specific circumstances. Um, how how would we factor in uh, information about you know family medical expenses or other extraordinary expenses, and and how would would that information be communicated to the office? Great question. We have a financial aid appeal process, and there is a link on our financial aid page, and that's how the family communicates those changes to us. There are different categories that they could choose from, and and upload supporting documentation to document those higher expenses 
um, to us. And it, the appeals committee meets regularly and reviews these requests and the supporting documentation to see if there's any opportunity for the institution to, to offer added assistance. Uh, another, well, two, I'll, I'll give you these both at the same time, because they're very similar. So two other circumstances that might affect your financial aid. Um, could you speak a little bit to how we consider equity in a home um, and uh, how we consider uh, divorced family situations? Okay, great. We'll cover the equity in the home. And I'm so glad that this was brought up because that is one of the distinctions of Hamilton College need-based philosophy is we do not consider home equity in your primary home or the value of retirement um, accounts in the analysis, in the needs analysis and the calculation of the family contribution. So those are two big distinctions in the Hamilton College philosophy compared to other institutional IM schools um, in, our, in our peer group. And then secondly, we would, I'm sorry, so we don't count home equity and retirement account value in the expected family contribution, but we will consider home equity in any outside in, um, investment property, you know, non-primary home residence and outside retirement investment consideration. So those two assets we will consider. And the second part of the question was regarding... How do we consider divorced family situations? Okay. We, ex again, going back to that fundamental concept of we expect the entire family to contribute towards this educational expense, we consider non-custodial, if, a, if a, your primary, if your parent is divorced, we will consider your parents' income, your custodial parents' income and assets, and your non-custodial's income and assets in the calculation of the EFC, along with any new spouse income and assets if the two parents are remarried. So on the CSS profile, that is the application that will ask for the custodial and non-custodial section. And rest assured that it's very confidential and separate. There is no commingling of parent data regarding custodial and non-custodial. So rest assured that that is um, built into the application process. A uh, question here about whether the cost of attendance is any different based on your location? Does it change at all for in-state or out-of-state students? There is a slight variance in the travel allowance, depending on how far you're traveling um, to Hamilton College to, um, to go home on breaks and in between winter, uh, fall and, and winter semesters. And so the, the back and forth travel. So yes, there is a slight variance depending on where you're traveling from. Cost of flights are, are um, calculated travel expense, et cetera. Um, when uh, considering the financial aid package again, uh, would you, how would you factor in outstanding student loan debt uh, or other type, types of debt that the family might already have? We don't, unfortunately. The, um, the FAFSA does not consider any um, outstanding debt, um, monthly expenses in the calculation of the, of the family contribution number. As with the profile, we are really looking at resources, whether you're choosing to use those resources that are not really a consideration. We are using available resources or a portion of available resources uh, in, in the terms of income and assets to, to calculate this family contribution. So debt burden, graduate level student loans on parents isn't really a consideration. You could potentially submit that as appeal request if the graduate school is a requirement for your employer and your employment. That may be something that we can investigate. Um, but in general, graduate, parent, graduate, educational expenses are not considered. Uh, after someone has completed the net price calculator, is it possible to go a step further and get a sort of pre-read on their financial aid package at Hamilton? No, unfortunately not. That is our pre-read access for our families. <laughs> um, is our we, we are very intentional on setting up our net price calculator every year to align with our current methodology. So it's a pretty good, it's, it's, as, it's as strong an output as strong the input is. So if you're entering accurate data of income, the right income and assets, then you're going to have a pretty, pretty close, accurate information about your family contribution. It is an estimate. We will not honor the, the net price calculator. We will, we are doing our analysis and our individual verification of CSS profile, FAFSA data, and tax return information to, to ultimately calculate our EFC. Um, but the 
the net price calculator versus the my intuition is a more accurate calculation. Well, and related question, is the net price calculator the same at all schools that have it, or is it using individual calculations? It's using individual calculations. Every school has to have one according to federal regulation, um, but how they set it up is definitely specific to the institution. Um, Follow-up question on the divorce family situation is how to handle a non-custodial parent who is estranged. Uh, is it possible to leave them off the CSS profile, for example? That is when you call our office and give us a, well, let's open up a dialogue about that situation and see what supporting documentation may, we may be able to re receive. Um, as an example, there are cases where we are exclude the non-custodial parent in in documentation from third party sources of, of severe case of abandonment, abuse, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there is an opportunity to have a discussion about that and see if it that third party documented waiver exists in, in the student family situation. Um, here's a kind of a specific question. I'm curious if you've heard of this one. Someone says they're, they've heard about error results from the IRS data retrieval tool that can't be changed um after after using it is that that's something you're familiar with the only thing that i think maybe they might be hinting at is um sometimes there's a if a parent were to have a rollover of a pension account from point a to point b that is an indicator on the tax return and there is a pop-up that asks a question where where the data retrieval tool kind of senses that this large amount of money may be an IR, IRA rollover and it asks a question are any of these funds on line 16 part of an IRA or pen, or rollover and if a if a family were to miss that question and ignore it or just not answer it or something then that total amount may be calculated in the adjusted gross income which would be influencing their family contribution so if that kind of error is what they might be thinking of, then that's also is a conversation with the financial aid office saying, listen, I think my, my rollover, my IRA rollover was included in my income. My income is not that high. Here's documentation that we can um, receive that explicitly says that it was an IRA rollover. Then we can extract that dollar amount from the FAFSA data, which will lower the EFC. So that is one error that I think maybe people consider an error, but it's maybe just a um, input data entry error. Um, beyond that, I haven't heard a lot of errors popping up from IRS data retrieval. Uh, we've got a question here about work study. Uh, is it $2,000 every two weeks? <laughs> no, it's $2,000 for an academic year or about $1,000 a semester. And that equates to about five to seven hours a week. Um, the student, you know, we encourage federal, we encourage campus employment for a host of reasons. It helps students get engaged in the in the campus and the campus life, meet some new individuals and, and resources and support offices across campus. It's really, really a positive um, um, activity to encourage. And, and data shows that it, our, our best engaged students are ones that are managing, they manage their time well, they're engaged, they're earning money, they're meeting friends, new, new entities across campus. It's a real positive event and we do encourage it. Um, we've got another question about the net price calculator. Okay. Uh, in the event someone fills out the net price calculator and get a result that's much different from what they expect and much different from what they're getting from other calculators or other schools, um, what would explain that? What should they do? We could look at the details of the entry of the data of the net price calculated entry um, and, and have a conversation with the parents of this is the number that we are using to calculate your um, expected family contribution. Um, I can't comment on what another school's calculator is doing because the methodology is so unique and specific to their purposes. Um, so I couldn't do that, but I can definitely kind of take a deeper dive on what our end result contribution is compared to what the calculator is estimating. 
A uh, couple of questions about the CSS profile. Are international students eligible for the for the waiver for the profile? Yes. Yes. Just contact our office if they're not prompted automatically. And um, how are business assets included in the CSS? Is it all of them? Is it a subset of them? It's all of them in general. Yes, it is all of them. Are, are there particular sub statements that are important for business assets? All the appropriate business schedules, Schedule C, um, E, will we'll ask for the file tax return and all appropriate schedules. Um, question about student loans. Um, can the loans be paid in a lump sum? Is yes. it possible to pay them off earlier? Can you do it before graduation? Absolutely. Or yes, there is no prepayment penalty on any federal student loan. You can take the loan out, secure it, keep it per week, and turn around and pay it off. Um, you'll, and you'll save a lot of interest. And we encourage we encourage students to accept their student loans too. It has a little bit of buy-in in this process. Um, it builds their credit re score and their credit um, record. And it's a it's a healthy low interest rate fixed loan to begin their credit history. Um, question about timing of, of the FAFSA again. Uh, so can you submit that before you've submitted your application to the school? Absolutely, yes. And that's and that's another advantage with the Department of Ed rolling out the, the application earlier in the cycle, just to reduce a little bit of stress for our families when they have so much to do in this, in this exciting time of, of year for them. But if they can get the FAFSA done and out of the way sooner, just just do it, go for it. You know, we really encourage it. Um, question about whether you have any particular recommendations on where to look for outside scholarships. Are there websites that you would recommend or trusted uh, places where a student could look for that additional uh, source? Great question. I would first start with your high school guidance counselor and um, high school to see if they have published local scholarship providers that are very generous to their local community. I would also look with mom and dad's employer and see if there's an, uh, a, an internal scholarship opportunity. So many times they don't even think of them until your child's 18. And then there may be some, some um, internal employer scholarship that they can apply to that may have a reduced competitive um, base of students competing for it. FastWeb is another national um, well-vetted scholarship search engine. Um, I would I would start with those those and air, the student's employer if if they are currently working. I hear Taco Bell has a fabulous outside scholarship. Um, so yeah, I, I I think start local a little bit. See see what's in the in that you can um, compete against locally. Um, the local government area foundations are often very generous to their local high schools and communities. I would start in your, for example, we had a, um, a local Rochester area foundation. There may be similar, similar in different counties, Oneida, um, um, et cetera. So I would start with your local government agencies too. Uh, another scholarship question. You mentioned uh, applying for TAP or other state scholarships using the FAFSA. Um, is that only eligible or only available for people who live in that state? New York State TAP is only eligible for students that attended a New York State high school um, and our current New York State residents. So that is limited to New York State residents only. The other outside neighboring um, states, for example, Vermont has a VSAC scholarship, an internal state scholarship that will travel with the student. Unfortunately, New York State TAP does not travel with the student if they attend a college outside of New York State, but Vermont has a different policy and Vermont residents, their state money is able to travel to Hamilton. So um, it all depends on your state grant that exists. Um, clarification on the logistics of the FAFSA. Who is ultimately submitting the FAFSA? Is it the student submitting it or the parent? Both, technically. Both student and parent need to sign the FAFSA. That's why you have to create that FSA ID for both the parent and the student. That is your electronic signature to complete the FAFSA. So only one parent um, in a, mar a married um, household 
only one parent has to sign the FAFSA, not both parents, but the student definitely needs to sign it. In fact, that's a common error or incomplete status that we get from the Department of Ed saying, oh, missing student signature, missing student signature, or missing parent signature. And that's when we reach out to our families saying, oh, we got your FAFSA, but you just need to go back in and make that correction that I mentioned earlier. Don't start a new FAFSA. Just go back into the existing one, the 23-24 FAFSA, select, I want to make a correction, and link right to the signature page and enter the um, parent FSA ID, and you're good to go. Um, if you don't think you're going to qualify for financial aid, is it still worth it to file the FAFSA and or CSS profile? Absolutely. It's worth your time and energy for 30 minutes to see if you have any, any need-based aid eligibility from the college. Um, and it, it's not a, a one and done situation either. You're you're able to apply every single year to see if your financial resources are, have changed over the prior years. And maybe it's an opportunity um, to receive need-based aid, but it doesn't hurt, especially as an incoming freshman. Why take the chance of any money being left off the table for this, this educational expense? Mm -hmm. um, submit the FAFSA. We will kindly reply, we received your FAFSA. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, um, the student's not eligible for need-based aid. But the FAFSA would always garner the access to unsubsidized non-need-based aid, which is unsubsidized loan of either $3,500 or $5,500. Or the FAFSA is always needed for a parent plus loan. Perhaps the family doesn't have the amount of family contribution that they're expected. They can borrow it in a parent plus loan or a private student loan. And the FAFSA will be needed for um, access to the parent plus loan. And um, the FSA ID again would be needed to sign the parent plus application. Happy to talk more about plus loans if that's a, a question that you see. Um, question about when uh, students receive financial aid. Uh, at what point do they receive a package? Excellent and uh, what do they do if they were looking at that package and they don't find it to, to be affordable for them? Mm -hmm. Great questions. So um, another awesome feature of Hamilton College is that at the time of admission, um, uh, notification, acceptance, we will also inform our families of the financial aid package. So there's not a mystery of what resource, resources you're eligible for. So on our ED1 and ED2 um, admitted students, they will be informed of their acceptance to admission and their financial aid package at the same time. Same thing with our regular decision students. So it's immediate. Um, and what was the second part of the question? I, what if they determine that it's not sufficient? Oh. Uh, they're looking at the aid and, and they're not sure that it, they can make Hamilton work. Excellent. Yeah, that's when you have the conversation with us. I mean, we really welcome our families to have open, open up conversations and dialogues with us and see if there's an opportunity for a financial aid appeal, if there's other outside life things happening that we just don't know and they can document added expenses because of, then we can potentially incorporate them into another review and see if any additional institutional aid is available. Uh, one thing that I thought I might add from my own experience working in the admission office is that you get your financial aid package if you have completed your financial aid uh, checklist and submitted yeah, all the documents. Good point. Good technical point. Ben. Yeah. Yes, thank and so, you very so much. make sure that you're you're getting all your stuff in because uh, right. otherwise you'll get a very nice letter about how we are unable to provide a package. Excellent point. I just assume everything's complete and tidy. Yeah, exactly. Um, question about um, uh, uh, some perhaps uh, different types of, of, of income students or, or individuals might have. Um, is Social Security considered income? Um, what about if somebody has um, a disability payment um, or, or other kind of, uh, are there retirement disbursements beyond Social Security that, how, that, how would that stuff be considered? Excellent, excellent. Yes, the FAFSA and the profile do consider taxable and untaxable income. So you would report all of those components. Um, and and then they will be formulated and included in the calculation. So they, they always ask taxable wage earned income and non-taxable income, um, child support received, um, pension distributions, et cetera, et cetera, would be counted for both the student and the parent if they apply. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you mentioned PLUS loans and we have since received several questions about what <laughs> PLUS loans are. So yeah, would, would you care to elaborate on PLUS loans? 
<laughs> okay, so the PLUS loan is a loan in the parent's name. And you apply for a PLUS loan every single year. And you, your application starts on the federal website, the same website that you do to complete the FAFSA. It's called studentaid.gov. And mom and dad, mom or dad need to initiate the application, not the student. The student cannot be submitting a plus loan and then just log, you know, signing with that's that's a violation. So the parent needs to be the one applying for this loan. There is no cap other than the total cost of attendance to borrow. So if the family needs to borrow the entire family contribution, they are out able to do so. It's not limited like the federal student loans are capped at $5,500 as a freshman. The parent plus rate is a little bit higher. Um, it's currently, i sorry, I don't know these rates off the top of my head, 6.8-ish fixed. Um, and it is interest bearing. So interest will accrue immediately upon the first fall disbursement and continue on through the life of the loan. So it's not interest free, like the subsidized student loan, it's definitely interest-bearing loan. Parents do not need to make any payments while your child is enrolled on your parent PLUS loan. So you would borrow, let's say if you need to borrow 30,000 every single year in a PLUS loan, you initiate a separate application every single year. Um, you have a total debt of $120,000 that you begin repayment when your child has completed um, their education and you have a six month grace period also. All separate three, all four separate loans will be sent to the same servicer. So you'll receive one bill um, for the whole debt and your payment restructure can be anywhere from 10 to 15, 20 year repayment. And again, there's no early penalty to pay it off. You can, you can make payments while the student's enrolled. You can send in $50 a month if you want. You can send them three, it doesn't matter. You know, once you begin paying, you're not obligated to continue to pay while they're in school. It's it's wise if you can to knock down the interest that's accruing, knock down the debt. Um, but it's a nice affordable way for families to, to pay the, the bill that's due and maybe pay back through a, a smaller increments over time. It's a great, great easy access loan. It's not as, um, um, the credit analysis is pretty liberal on it um, compared to a mortgage loan or car loan, et cetera, et cetera. So it's highly likely that you'll be approved for the dollar amount. Okay, uh, we are getting close to time here. So, so one final question as we wrap up, uh, and this one, this one's more general, um, but uh, thinking back to your own college process, your own experience in prior roles working with students through this process, um, what, what piece of advice would you give these students as they, they delve into their college search? I would say be engaged, be engaged in this process. Don't let mom and dad take the lead on it. Be informed about the applications, the deadlines, the information that's input on them, the results of them. Watch your email, your Hamilton email, because that's how we communicate to our students and families that we may need additional information, but be an active partner in this financial aid process. And it's a learning opportunity also. It's gonna help them manage their money well and, and um, be informed about the process. So I, I would say my overall arching recommendation is, is to be an active partner in this process. Great. And lean on us. We're here to guide the students and the families and anybody that wants a question, we're happy to help them. Our job is to help you. So yes, yes lean on us. We serve, we um, to serve. So, so thank you so much for all of you spending some time with us this evening. A special thank you to Executive Director Schutzo for answering all of our questions this evening. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this conversation. We are going to be hosting more virtual events throughout the summer. Um, please visit uh, hamilton.edu slash discover. One of my colleagues will put that in the chat um, for, for future events. And uh, if you have questions that weren't answered, I am sorry. They were coming in fast and furious. We tried to get to as many as we could, uh, but feel free to email those to admission at hamilton.edu or finaid at hamilton.edu. Uh, and again, one of my colleagues will put those emails in the chat as well. But thank you so much for your time and attention. We really appreciate you spending this evening with us uh, and we wish you all a very good night and an excellent application process. Thank you, everyone. Good night.